Okay, so I'll start sharing my screen. And hopefully everyone sees now. And as already mentioned, we're here to learn more about documentation and metadata. So who am I and why am I here to teach you things? I have master's degree in genetic engineering and work experience in natural sciences. But now for the past year, I've trained people in data management. I'm working as a data manager and I'm part of Elixir, which is a life sciences infrastructure in Europe. It's doing a lot of collaboration across different topics. And one of the topics is actually data management. We have a separate community and that's where we discuss data management related problems. If you want to join, you're always welcome. You don't have to be an Alexa member for that. But uh, now I'm gonna talk more about why we're here exactly. So the, the first up I'm gonna start, which is sources, because uh, you know this is just a very short introduction and you might have very specific questions. So I would recommend two re main resources. One of them is RDM Kit, so Research Data Management Kit. And this is the homepage. They have this uh, data lifecycle there, and it's mostly for scientists to browse through yourself. You can, of course, search some keywords that are relevant to you, or just go through this data lifecycle and see what you should do at each stage of your data. There's, you can go also by role, or domain by national or country. And currently there is 531 tools and resources and 122 pages of only about data management. And uh, there's actually a page about documentation and metadata. Another resource is uh, the MEG or data management expert guide. And this is more geared towards social sciences. And again, we see the data life similarly uh, data uh, life cycle, but like I said, the nuances are different. So why, why do we need this metadata? Start with what's the difference between metadata and data? So data is all digital resources that have been produced or used during or at the end of the project. So that includes not only text, or software or just spreadsheets, but also patient records, video files, measurement statistics, algorithms, codes, images, audio files, you know, anything. And metadata is the descriptive information about your data. So if you have an image file about, I don't know, your uh, cells or anything you have done with a microscope, then you already have automatic data about when the picture was taken, its resolution, size, what equipment was used. So th that is metadata. And if you have ever heard about FAIR recently, there's a FAIR is something that really funders want your data to be. So what does it mean? It means findable, inter accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And if you look closely, in almost each of their descriptions, we can find this metadata here, that metadata and data should be findable, should be accessible, and that's usually also written in metadata, interoperable and reusable. And when is data reusable? When it has well-described metadata. And if you look at this in practice part, we also notice that rich metadata is necessary almost everywhere. So how do we get this rich metadata? Or, and why some people still don't think it's necessary. It helps you yourself to understand your data set better because you, you have written out somewhere your data structure, rights and license, who generated and fair compliance. And it's in general, better data management. If you think about five or 10 years in the future, do you really think you'll remember the structure of your project or like what license you put somewhere or like who generated what part of the data? I mean, let's be honest, you won't. But if you write it down from the start, you just need to click on one file and be like, aha, there it is. And if you upload your data set, I mean, these days, 
many funders want you to upload your data set or at least metadata about it. It's easier if it's already in the beginning, you have the description of it. If you already have the project codes, the grant numbers, everything in one file, because later it's just simple copy paste. And people who say, like, oh, why do I need to upload this metadata? I mean, my data set can't be public. Maybe it has sensitive data. Whatever reasons. You still might get valuable collaborators. You still will get citations. And you can still have recognition in the community because even if you can't make your data set public, you can still say that this is the data set I have Please write me personally to get uh, um, you know, these proper licenses, or sometimes you need ethical board agreements, whatever. You can write it in that metadata, or just say, my data has been deleted due to these and these reasons, but I can still help you to set up similar uh, project. This is all valuable. So how to write it? So in general, metadata can be divided into three groups. This administrative metadata that uh, most people who have uh, written a project already can do in their sleep, where <laughs> this project ID, the partners, the funders, the length of the project. This is the most basic thing for scientists who are part of it. So this is what we mean when I say this general metadata file. There's also descriptive metadata. So this is where you put authors, headline, publications, protocols, the what, when, where, and who. So think of it like methods a bit in the articles. And then there's structural metadata. So this is more about how data folders relate to each other, how this data set relates to previous data, or like maybe so to some database or previous knowledge. This is also important because you, I'm sure we've all had that, mm, there was this data set, I put it somewhere, now where is it in what folder or how do these two relate to each other? Which, which version of this uh, file I'm supposed to use? The structure could help you. So like I mentioned before, first, like uh, this first step is to collect metadata and some of it already happens automatically digital cameras, microscopes, telescopes, just even recording something, you already get the length of it and uh, format. Another thing is extracted metadata collection. So this is metadata about researchers, like who did what part of this project? Who did the analysis? What is their ORCID? How to get into contact with them and so forth. And the last part is well, not the least and actually is the hardest part is this laboratory notebooks and any other methods or analysis you're doing, doing during your project. And in order to be useful, this metadata need, should be standardized. Agreeing on language, spelling, date formats, etc. And now this is also very hard because there's so many standards and people can get rightfully very confused. So I would recommend always starting with minimum information requirement. So here are three examples and MinSec is actually minimum information requirement for sequence experiments, I think. Now, not all fields have this. So use general ones. Dublin Core, Schema, DCAT, check if your field has it or by keywords, something else. Like I said, this is the hardest part. Some fields have so many that it might take you days to decide which standard to use. And others might have crickets. So always check for the minimum information requirement ones if there are any in your field, if not, it's okay to go with general one. And always write it in your data management plan. So here's an example. If you don't have the standard, you can write all of your project data in a lot of sentences. But if you need to really quickly find 
who is the PI, where it was. This is really hard to find. Like maybe this is on four, eight, four pages of text. You would need to read it from start to finish again. This is so much better. If you use a standard, you always know in which order these things are. Like if you know the creator is somewhere in the middle. Okay, look there, quick, you already have a name. Update frequency again, really quickly. And there's like, it's so human readable and you can find the information so much faster. Another thing why these standards are really good because they make things machine readable. Machines also like when things are always in the same order, but they just add a bit more code to it. But this is technically the same info. And usually you get the machines co converted already themselves to this machine readable format. So only thing you need to do is adhere to some standard and write in your metadata, I'm using the standard. So the machine can kind of understand what it's doing or AI or whatever is scraping the information. So let's talk about more about this general purpose versus the main specific. So the general ones are easier to use. They're widely adopted, but often they're not enough. There are some uh, things you might want to add more about your project. So these domain specific ones, there are some like DDI or Darwin Corp. They have richer vocabulary and structure, but they could be highly specialized and people outside of that domain might not understand. It. So it depends on your field, which one would you like to go for? Maybe it's such a specific topic that uh, general public wouldn't want to read about it, go with domain specific, but if there is a great public interest in it, maybe use Dublin Core. And here's an example of a Dublin Core metadata generator that asks all the same questions that the uh, standard does. So there's short version and long version. And if you take a look at this, there's title, creator, subject, description. We already know. You usually know all this and publisher. And these are really simple questions, but it would mean a lot if all the data sets out there and all the published posters and any other uh, research outputs who have this data right next to them. You can even put relationship to other previously uh, uh, published articles or data sets, like when was it made, what type is it, and language. This is all very useful. And then you should choose your vocabulary. Because a lot of people don't think about it. Yes, you can write woman or female in so many different ways, but later when the machine uses it, if you only use the keyword female, it would, might leave out everything that uses the keyword woman in their project. So choose one and stick to it throughout your project too and save your metadata. What's even worse that same, some word might mean different things in different fields. Let's talk about this word cup. It could be a teacup, uh, what is the sports cup or your bra cup. And if you're very confused and you don't know where to go, what to search for, go to your database you use the most, repository or journal in your field and check what vocabularies and standards they use. It's usually somewhere in the about this database place. Just go look there, see what they write. It might be a long page and it might take you maybe 10 minutes to find this, but 90% of the time it's written there and might save you a lot of time. So instead of looking for the standard, you just kind of go to your favorite database and there you have. So here's a lot of links that I'm not gonna go through now, but I just want to warn you that sometimes uh, one ontology may not be sufficient to describe your data and accept terms that are good enough. Step four, choose your metadata location. Technically you have two options. Keep it inside the file, so the metadata always moves with the data. The association is clear. Unfortunately, not all metadata fields can be added this way. Searching could be slow and it's not easy to manage if there's a lot of 
data and you want to search it fast. It has many different files. If they're in separate files, they could be very flexible as in you could add images, maybe very long text, because it doesn't matter, it's a separate file. Now the question association between the files might get trickier because if you only move your data and not the metadata, then the connection might get lost. And also not all easy to manage sometimes. So depending on how many files you have and on your preference, it is recommended to keep it in a separate file. But again, if you have very few files and uh, very little metadata to add, maybe just keep it inside the file. And then finally, you need to write it. And if you are uploading to a database, most of the choices have been taken care of by the database. So they usually ask your name, your title, the year, and the publisher anyways. And it's machine and human readable. So here's an example of Zenodo. The things it asks from you are also based on a standard. It even asks a version and language. And here's an example of a project that's metadata is public, but if you look at it, it's actually files are closed access, but we can still find out what it was about. The keywords makes it machine readable. It has this toy link that will be always available. So let's talk about another uh, documentation. It's called data dictionary. So data dictionary usually accompanies your data set. So spreadsheets, for example, defining the headers and variables in your data set. Not always can we write the full length variables there and headers. So maybe we make them shorter. Then in, you write in your data dictionary, the long version of it, why did you make it shorter or why did you choose this one? Units, expected minimum, maximum values, any other notes you can put in data dictionary. And here's an example. Uh, in this case, they actually write to which file name it goes to, the variable name, the label. They have used an ontology. If you do not have ontology, just write here longer what it means if you have to. Because species name, for instance, can get tricky sometimes. Another one is a codebook. So codebook is a longer document. It's similar in a way that it accompanies the data set, but there's also on top of the variable names and labels, it can have concept categories, cases, frequency counts, notes, and so on. So here are some uh, examples I have listed. You can click through them later if you wish. And the di difference is that data dictionary is usually formatted as a spreadsheet or table, and it's part of data sets metadata, while codebook is a separate file and include sometimes even interpretation. And this is an example. This is from a survey that asks for citizenship status and type. See, we see the definition. Uh, what was it reported for? Some statistics, uh, how many people have answered, how many were invalid answers. And look at the notes, how long they are. For each answer, see category one, they explain very fully and thoroughly what it means. Usually most people don't need to make code book, but it's very useful when you have qualitative data, when you have non-numerical data that requires coding in categorization in order to analyze. And in order to analyze them, we usually make coding and that coding needs to be very uh, transparent and visible and you need to write it somewhere. So this is where you write it. Read me, document describing also the data set. Now, read me is the most flexible of them as it doesn't really have any structure. All you need to know about it basically is that its name is read me uh, in capital letters and a simple text, the file is perfect. Of course, you can make it machine readable and use standards, but it's not a requirement. It's, it's a bit of a wild west, if you may. So best practices are that you each data set get its own readme. You're consistent about it. You use the same date formats all the time. 
And you follow the scientific conventions that you follow anyway in your field. So taxonomy, geospatial names, some keywords. And I'm gonna give you a template example here. Now you don't need to use this, but you can get inspired by it. As in look at the things that are useful to mention in your readme. And think of it this way. If you open your project maybe five to 10 years later, then it's always so good if you have this readme file, you click on it and all the information about this project is in one place. So let's start with this administrative metadata. So title of it, author information, uh, date of collection, location, goes into this licensing information, uh, file structures, are there multiple versions of the data set? And then describe the methods, the instruments, conditions, variables, those. But you can make it way shorter. Like here's a real life example of uh, our university's repository. Here's a random one I took that has a readme here. And what is it about? Some cloud traces for better cloud service reliability. And if you peek inside, it's actually very short, but it gives us what each file contains, the description of it, the paper it, it's part of, this uh, published article, how to cite it properly, and who to contact for further questions. Now, yes, README can contain a lot of things, but this is actually also very useful because sometimes when you download just files or data sets, you don't usually get their in their file name with which article uh, it goes together with. You usually get this oh, data set uh, human, maybe human, maybe some cancer. And that's it. You don't, you have this file and then that's it. You don't know where it came from, what article it goes with or who to cite. If you have README, you can go download together. And even in five years, you still know where you got this data set and who to contact if you have further questions. Yeah, another sorry really for like... interrupting. Yes. Uh, can we wrap up in around two minutes, please? So that we can yes. have them for Q&A. Thanks. Yes. So here's a real life example of one. And if you look inside, again, simple explanations. It's not for pages. It's actually one page, just didn't fit into one slide. So how to start? First off, don't panic. <laughs> start as early as possible and think of the information that is needed. And I hope you can create a separate documentation file. If you already know where you will deposit the data, go look what standards they're using and use the same ones. And I hope the thing you can take away home here is that there's metadata, which is general information, README that has description of data set, basically your methods and materials, and data dictionary goes to your spreadsheets. So thank you. So thank you so much. Fantastic. You made it look like fun. I don't know how. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to make sure people don't fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I thought I was engaging, seriously. Um, okay, so the the idea is that if anyone has questions um, right now, we can, you know, uh, present the question, you can say it out loud or in the chat, or we can read the pad if there are any, anything there. Um, and then we can also, and then we go to the breaker rooms. Um, so I think everyone said spoken or written. Patricia, I think you haven't uh, added an S or W. Um, so let's see, is there any questions for now? We're gonna go to the breaker there rooms. Are in oh, okay, perfect. Um, the thing is that I'm, I'm, I was going to say that we can come back to after the breaker rooms with more questions. So. Let's see. Well, I can start with the first one. What's the difference between data standard, data ontology, and vocabulary? See, metadata standard is just uh, which things are you 
useful or actually make your data reusable in the future, as in things you should mention that may make your data reusable for others. Ontology and vocabulary are more the terms you use to describe your data. One of them is uh, also shows the hierarchy between the terms. So uh, cell and how it relates to, you know, Mm, DNA and all that kind of things. It's a whole, it's a whole hierarchy and system how they go together. Now I'm gonna be honest. Uh, this is six p p.m. and I don't remember which one was the hierarchical one. <laughs> but yeah, it doesn't really. If there is the hierarchical system for you, use that one. But usually they're very far and few between. So. Ontology of vocabulary, vocabulary both are for the terms and standard is just which things are useful for others to reuse your data. So another one, how do you choose between developing a data dictionary or code book for a project? I would always start with data dictionary because that's useful for every, any spreadsheet you have. As, and code book is more for this qualitative ones, not quantitative ones. So if you have survey and you need to codify your answers later, that's where I go for a code book. If you don't know, and in your field, usually you don't see code books, don't start making it. It is a very big and complicated thing. But if you know in the articles you read or in your field, you constantly stumble upon code books, that's when I would start thinking about it, not before. But data dictionary is way simpler. So what are our responsibilities as reviewers in the publication process to help encourage this kind of documentation? Well, the simple met administrative metadata could be everywhere. So if, you, if, for instance, you're reviewing an article and there's mm, a clause that says you need to upload your data set somewhere, you could ask for them to follow maybe some kind of standard if they upload it. So that administrative metadata would follow a standard and you could also ask them to add data dictionary. That's something you we could ask scientists to do. But maybe their tables or that spreadsheet is formatted so well that everything is understandable without it. I don't know, it depends. Sometimes it's not necessary, but most of the times it could benefit from some kind of extra explanations. So right now, that's all the questions that were in the pad. Right. So we go to I'm creating the breakout room, so uh, once again. Okay, I can start explaining what you need to do. So basically, you go to this um, fairsharing.org, and you can start looking for a standard that could be relevant in your field. Now, fairsharing.org, if you go to that page, there's a search bar. And, you, and on the left corner, there's also this button, standards. Click on it. Then at least it won't give you any databases and policies things, only standards. And on the left bit lower, there's another search. So start with your minimum requirement. See minimum requirement, maybe field related world, or just look through all minimum requirements. I don't currently remember how many it would give you and see if any of them are of use. And if not, Start looking by the keywords. Now this, I'm going to tell you honestly, this is quite hard task. Some fields find it within two minutes. Other field people sweat for 20 minutes and still find nothing. <laughs> so like I said, don't stress. Just try what you find, what you can see, what's interesting. And if not, there's always generic standards that you can follow. So this is it from me and I'm very interested to see what people come back to. Do they find anything? Do they come back frustrated? And please, yeah. there's going to be ready. more of you in a room. Help each other. Yeah. Um, Diana, I put you in one room. Do you want to be in one of the rooms or not? I can be. 
you can also leave whenever you want and go to other places. <laughs> you know, just go to the toilet or whatever. Um, all right. Okay. Bye bye. 15 minutes, people. Irene, no te mandé a ninguno. Sorry, I didn't send you. Oh, stop recording. Okay. All right. Uh, remember that the um, the chat isn't recorded in the in the video. So. Uh, all right. So I still so see some people on in the breaker rooms, uh, but maybe not. I don't. Know. Well. Okay, we have a few minutes. Um, is there anyone willing to share one insight or or questions uh, after this exercise? Or in the in the in the chat or in the pad? In the pad would be line one nine four. There's one of someone is writing here. I, I, I just want to to say something that we talked with Derek that Derek is busy <laughs> writing the notes. <laughs> uh, it, it was something important that he mentioned uh, about the the vocabularies, and especially when you have to to pair these with local languages of indigenous language, it's it's, it's uh, sometimes it's 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 almost impossible to. To do it, so I, I, I think it's something important I you want to, to mention. As a translation of terms, well, uh, I'm an Estonian that's spoken by what about one million people, so you can imagine we're not hot with all the translation services and all the standards are never in Estonian, but. Uh, there is even an attempt sometimes when people try to translate these huge vocabularies, but there's so few people. And it's usually, you know, people are happy if it's done at least in English. But yeah, if there's a huge group of people who want to use those terminology in their own local language, then you should maybe start the community to who would deal with this because only the people who are in this field know actually how to accurately convey the terms. Now, I don't know how many uh, standards there are that are not in English in fair sharing. I have never checked. I don't even know how to check this. Did any of you find anything that wasn't in English? So, so normally on, on websites, there is a little code that says the different language, either EN or, or ZU for Zulu or mm -hmm. AF, but I can't see any of those codes on, on the on the websites that, that you showed us. So I'm assuming um, that's not there. No, there isn't indeed. These are very generic uh, links as in they're not country specific. There might be country specific resources, but since I come from a very small country, I didn't check for all the other countries. So I'm sorry for that. But uh, maybe there is a community of people you could ask. Maybe somebody knows. There are usually some email lists. You could just throw the question into the either and hope it responds. I, I think an organization in Europe called Claren might be able to address it. I, I, I'll follow up with them. Good. Great uh, final question. What a, what a topic. Right, Nicolas? <laughs> I mean, you. And Spanish is so uh, spoken by, by so many millions of people, and still, like a lot of resources are not, yeah, are not in Spanish. Um, okay, we need to go if we want to keep the OLS tradition of, uh, you know, staying on time. Um, uh, if there are any other questions or anything, I'm gonna invite you to put them in the Slack. Uh, because the Slack is more yeah, seen by everyone, um, uh, not in the pod. 
you can do both anyways um and thank you so much for for coming i think you had a you had a good time in the broker rooms it seems i was checking and there were people talking all the time and writing <laughs> um yeah and thank you diana lovely presentation yeah you're great at presenting i told you that already i think but um okay uh applause for diana and for thank all you. of you and see you soon next week bye ciao, ciao thank people. you diana thank you Have a good weekend, everyone. Yes.